1950s with the rise of the Cold War and the Red Scare and things like that, the whole idea was that Hollywood should stick to what Hollywood knows how to do, which is to entertain. And this was a very, very tough time in Hollywood. Audiences were declining rapidly uh, from, I think, 1946 until 1962. Every year, the audience in America declined for films. Uh, at the same time, there was the rise of television, there was more foreign competition, uh, loss of foreign markets. So it was a really very nervous time in the industry. And so people were looking for sure bets. Stanley Kramer is one of those figures who, at a certain point, say, in, at least in my education, became a, a little bit of a whipping boy for certain people because his films had a kind of obvious liberal slant and, and you know, again, the issues were usually underlined and had exclamation points at the end. It was, subtlety was not, I guess, a great part of Mr. Kramer's repertoire. However, you know, seen from more of a distance, he comes across to me more and more as a very courageous figure. He was one of the most successful independent producers making films in Hollywood in the late 50s and 60s. And that the audiences embraced them showed how in touch he was with the taste of the average movie goer. Kramer really found his niche as a socially conscious filmmaker. He carried that from his days as a producer into his directing career. As a director, he directed The Defiant Ones, Judgment at Nuremberg, uh, the most famous probably now, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, as well as some oddball things like Mad, 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 Mad World. He was an issues guy. I mean, even I knew this before I really, really thought about you know, writing about film. Or, I mean, I knew in the 60s and 70s, Stanley Kramer had a certain type of movie that was sort of dealt with issues, nuclear war, like on the beach, um, evolution and the, the Scopes trial, and Inherit the Wind. Craig Cohen was the head of, uh, of Columbia Pictures and brought um, Stanley Kramer in to produce 30 films over five years, low budget films. Kramer immediately kind of distanced himself from Harry Cohen. I can't tell you why exactly. They just didn't like each other. And Kramer was determined to have his autonomy right from the beginning of his career. K Mutiny was the only movie that Kramer made for Cohen that made money. <laughs> I think it, the movie cost 2.3. I think it made about 11 or 12 million. Uh, and so it made up for all the losses <laughs> before. So. Cohn was happy and, and everybody was sort of happy at the end of it. The studio system was beginning to wobble at that point, the late 40s. It had not yet broken apart, but it was beginning to wobble. And, and guys like Kramer, who were at the forefront of independent producers, he, he had a, a producing deal with Columbia, but he also had a producing deal with uh, United Artists. Next week, this time, you'll have yourself a new captain. Lieutenant Commander Philip Francis Quig. Feel better? Definitely, sir. Stanley Kramer bought this book um, when it was not a bestseller. It had just come out. It got mixed reviews at first, and then it, and he bought it at that point. I think he paid $60,000 for it. I'm not positive of that number, but uh, he didn't pay an enormous amount of money. Even in those days, that was not an enormous amount of money. Um, and then the book just kind of lifted off and finally wound up winning the Pulitzer Prize. Initially, the Navy did not want to cooperate with the film. The whole idea of the Kane mutiny, as a number of people have commented, uh, if it had been called the Kane incident, they, the Navy probably would have been happy to cooperate, but it was the Kane mutiny, their position being that uh, there had never been a mutiny in the Navy, a somewhat disputable historical fact. So they did not want, want to cooperate. Uh, when the author found this out, he was a former Navy man, he was so distressed at one point that he offered to give the money back that he'd been paid for the film rights. And uh, Kramer was extremely angry at him and called him a jellyfish and uh, uh, they, they had words. But ultimately, the combination of uh, Herman Wilkes involvement, the Navy Department's involvement, uh, I mean, um, uh, the technical advisor on the film, a number of things brought the film to a place where Wilkes was happy and the Navy Department was happy. And uh, Most Navy personnel at that time felt the film was quite accurate. And in fact, they would have taken over the ship too. That was the consensus of opinion amongst Navy men. They, they would have 
uh, taken command of the ship. In those extreme circumstances, the idea being that there was this series of extreme circumstances never all lined up at, in the same way in the history of the nation. Captain, we're in serious trouble. Mr. Merrick, if you question my decisions once more, I'll order you off this bridge. Houndsman, come left. Still, Will, steady as you go. Willie, note the time. Captain, I'm sorry, but you're a sick man. I'm relieving you as captain of this ship under Article 184. So the fact that there was any hesitation on the part of any studio shows you again, at this time when the fortunes of the studios are going down, does show you what a kind of hot property it was, or at least dangerous property, uh, potentially controversial and things like that. They were also, I think, able to assemble a terrific cast, and that cast really certainly helped fill that out. Uh, watching the film and seeing even small parts being played by people like Steve Brody yes, or Lee sir. Marvin shows you that clearly this was a film that a lot of people Thanks, wanted to be associated with. A few of the guys chipped in and I think Dimitrik is an interesting figure in that he somewhat charts the transition maybe between the 40s and the 50s. Uh, in the late 1940s, he made a number of very impressive works, uh, Cornered, Crossfire, a number of films that really gained him a reputation. Then, of course, he was one of the Hollywood Ten, the only director, actually, among the uh, people who were uh, accused, you know, or were part of the Hollywood Ten. Later, he recanted and became a friendly witness. And then, when you see his works in the 50s, they, in many ways, are somewhat the inverse of the works from the 40s. Uh, rather than people sort of uh, understanding that they need to be on their own or in a certain way or fighting against kind of impossible, uh, invisible forces, now suddenly it's about joining the team. It's about being much more part of something larger. Lily. Sir, you look worried. Well, I know that a man shirts a petty detail, but big things are made up of details. Don't forget, one of a nail, the horseshoe was lost, and then the whole battle. Captain's job is a lonely one. He's easily misunderstood. Kramer signed him to a directing deal, and he made a number of low-budget, quickly made very good noir small films. In describing some of the staples of film noir, like um, sh facial shadows and, and things like that, basically he said they did it mostly as an economical move and not as a stylistic form which would have some expressionist meaning. Well, he was known as a very efficient director who could make films on a budget in a tight schedule. That was one of his great gifts. and. His films had a very, probably maybe because of his editing uh, background, they were very well shot. They, they, the pieces connected together in a very taut manner. Dimitrik did not like the fact that his, that scholars pigeonholed him as a film noir director. I think he actually preferred works like The Cane Mutiny and uh, The Young Lions as like, things that he felt were, he was at the top of his game. Mr. Marek, who's the morale officer? There is no morale officer, sir. Who's the junior ensign? Keith, sir. Mr. Keith? Sir? You are now the morale officer. In addition to your other duties, you will see to it that every man keeps his shirt tail tucked inside his trousers. Aye, aye, sir. Hey. If I see another shirt tail flapping while I'm captain of this ship, woe betide the sailor, woe betide the OOD, and woe betide the morale officer, I kid you not. The film is an ensemble piece, partially because it had come from play, but that's one, that, they don't use a lot of aspects of the play, but they caught the ensemble quality. The person who's on screen more than anyone is, is Robert Francis, uh, an actor who only did four movies. He was killed in a plane crash in 1955. Um, and was one of the hot young kids on his way. He's on screen more than anyone. Jose Ferrer had been nominated or may have won for Cyrano de Bergerac the year before. Bogart was, was a huge star, a number of nominations at that point. Van Johnson was a much loved movie star, more known for kind of musicals and, and light comedy, who's terrific in this movie. 
Uh, it's really an ensemble piece uh, where it's it's pretty uniformly cast very strongly. Just to show you the like the depth of the acting talent in in, in the Kane Mutiny. I mean, you go to the uncredited roles, and you have somebody like James Edwards, who's playing Whitaker. Another actor, sort of that people would know, is Herbert Anderson. He played the father of Dennis the Menace in Dennis the Menace. And you really don't see him. He sort of hovers in the background most of the movie, uh, like at the meetings. He doesn't have much to say, and he's at the party at the end. And then the third uh, uncredited actor, probably one of the top character actors in movie history is Whit Bissell. He plays the psychiatrist. A paranoid personality, but that is not a disabling illness. The, the performances in the film are extraordinary, and Bogarts is, is one of several. Fred McMurray is, is uh, somewhat cast against type. Uh, he would obviously go on to star in My Three Sons and other things, but had done Double Indemnity and in some of the other more uh, uh, disreputable characters. Um, but playing an intellectual was not something I saw McMurray do a lot. Uh, Tom Tully, who was nominated for Best Supporting Actor, who plays the skipper at the, the beginning of the film, was, was terrific. In it. May I see your orders and qualifications jacket, or are they a military secret? But everyone in the film, it's a very, very strong cast. Um, I think that, it's, it's, uh, that it had been done as a play uh, so successfully drew a lot of actors. Uh, when the K Mutiny was published, the story goes that Bogart wanted the role and campaigned for it. The director said of Kramer that it was a stroke of near genius casting Humphrey Bogart, and it was certainly an inspired uh, choice. Whether it was near genius, he'd already done in 47, he'd done Treasure of Sierra Madre, he'd done uh, In a Lonely Place, he'd played a cracked up or a man on the verge of cracking up a number of times in his career. He also was an enormous star in 1953 when this film was made. He was pretty much at the, he had authority, um, but he was able to play Watch. to a darkness and a, and a fear in himself that very few actors had. It's really an extraordinary performance. And certainly I'd say if you're thinking of, you know, the 10 great Humphrey Bogart performances, and he's, to my mind, one of Hollywood's greatest actors, uh, Cain Mutiny would be among them. Uh, In a Lonely Place, which was actually a film that Bogart himself produced, and I think a project he felt very personally about, is in a certain way I think even a more remarkable performance, and it would be interesting to actually see the two films together because I think Cui grows out of his... Uh, Dixon Steele, the character he plays in, in A Lonely Place. Again, someone who on the surface seems relatively normal and even somewhat charming in his way, but yet as time goes on you can begin to see how the cracks show through uh, in the great courtroom scene at the end. I mean, it's just incredible to watch how Bogart modulates his performance there, how he goes from someone seemingly completely normal to you start getting a little sense of tension in the voice till finally by the end he's made the case for the defense lawyer. Uh, it's, it's really a great performance and I think a tribute to him as an actor and of course to Dimitri as a director that they were able to sort of show so convincingly that transition. I think, I think if, if, if Bogart's competition, he was nominated for best actor that year, uh, hadn't been uh, Marlon Brando on, on the waterfront, I, Bogart would have won in a walk. Stanley Roberts' adaptation of the Kane Mutiny, I mean, it's faulted for the romance, but I think overall he took, he did a, a pretty good job of taking as many elements as he could within that two hour frame. Uh, Edward Demetric mentioned that this is a, you know, a movie that could have been 15 hours long, and, and it's, it's true because I think he, even he sensed that a lot is missing and, and here you have a character like Willie Keith who is the mainstay of the book and is one of the mainstays of the movie he is severely weakened by having it being a two-hour movie. Herman Wilk was part of the process of changing it. I think that he felt uncomfortable with leaving the impression that uh, a Navy man would crack up and one of the things he adjusted between the book and the play and, and the final movie that came out was that one the crew didn't back up their captain and left him kind of hanging and alone 
and to some degree was complicit in setting up the situation that caused this man to, 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 to lose his nerve and to crack up. I've been thinking about Article 184, and I've got to admit you're right. Uh, that's an adjustment from the, both the play and the book. And I think that was Herman Wolf trying to be loyal uh, to the Navy he very much loved and very much respected. The, I think that a lot of people involved with this project had enormous amounts of respect and love for the Navy and wanted to tread extra carefully on not giving an impression that they felt was inaccurate. Sometimes the, the captain of a ship needs help, and by help I mean uh, constructive loyalty. What I'm trying to say is a, a, a ship is like, is like a family. Uh, we, we all have our ideas of right and wrong, but we, we have to pitch in for the, for the good of the family. The movie's very accurate on any number of levels, by the way. They took a lot of care in how a ship's run, the chain of command, and what those issues are, and how it plays out. The only villain in the piece is the Fred Murray character. It's certainly not Captain Queek. It's uh, who's a man who's in the in the film version anyway, shown to be a, under enormous stress, has served for a long time, and has, has kind of been broken by the by the strain and isolation of command. Other people had done this Twelve O'clock High with Gregory Peck. It had been done a number of times in movies, though more clearly how the, those were movies about how the strain of command broke them. This was a movie where the man was a, kind of on his way to being broken, and we kind of come into that story two-thirds of the way through. It's happened before that a man loses his head after what Quig has gone through. That's a very endearing explanation, but it won't hold. Has the thought ever occurred to you that our captain might be unbalanced? Oh, cut the jokes. Tom. I'm no psychiatrist, but I know something about abnormal behavior. Captain Quig has every symptom of acute paranoia. It's interesting to think that the film comes out in the same year as On the Waterfront. And in many ways, as much as On the Waterfront has, I think, often been read correctly as Elie Kazan's defense of what he did, you know, in terms of uh, uh, talking about, you know, informing on some of his uh, former colleagues and things like that before the House on american Activities Committee. Uh, in the same way, I think one can read perhaps this film as a kind of uh, somewhat offbeat and off-centered kind of defense by Dimitrik of what he did. You know, I think there's a way in which you can see both of these films about people giving testimony. I felt it was my duty as a naval officer. Captain Quig was sick, mentally ill, and I had to take over. And I tell you honestly, if I had to do it again, I'd do it.